Hello, good evening, and welcome to the TNT Show, The Nation Talks. I'm John Drummond, and I'm your host for the next 60 minutes. You know, it's been another great day for British democracy. We hear that the Prime Minister seems so terribly frightened of the First Minister, uh, he doesn't want to meet with her, uh, despite, that is, signalling to the whole world ahead of time that he wants all parts of the UK to work together. It's an odd way to work together, to turn down the invitation to meet. But maybe he wants to work together on Zoom. Maybe that's what he meant. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt there. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, tonight, we are talking to Julie Hepburn. Now, Julie is, is a well-known SNP activist, uh, but we'll be talking to her about her experience on the Social Justice and Fairness Commission uh, and her take on what's happening in Scotland and, and so much more besides. And she will be taking your questions live. Details on how to submit your questions are on the What's On Guide at whatsonguide.scot. Any questions, queries, comments, file them there. They'll get through to us. Our producer takes them and sends them on. Uh, and she'll be taking your questions live. So make sure you get your questions in if you don't mind. As you know, TNT stands for The Nation Talks. So in many respects, this is your show. Uh, and we're live. And we're free. So no license, no problem. You get the very best guests and you don't have to pay and you can submit questions and it's live. So we don't go hiding away between the recordings and all of any of that stuff. What you see is what you get. Now, to our guest tonight. Tonight, the nation talks to Julie Hepburn. How are you, Julie? How are you and the family coping with the pandemic? Uh, well, we're getting through it. I think the same as pretty much everyone else, but, you know, absolutely cannot complain. Um, you know, still being able to work from home and, um, you know, luckily we've not been in a position of having uh, lost anyone close close to us either. So I think that's a really privileged position to really come through it as unscathed as, as we have thus far. So cannot complain. Absolutely cannot complain. It could be a lot worse. And do you find the schools have helped or hindered in that regard in keeping the family safe? Oh, I mean, I cannot um, fault my, my kids' school uh, at all. They were absolutely fantastic during the, the lockdown periods and supporting the kids' education at home, although it was an education uh, for me in, in a number of respects. Like a lot of uh, parents, I think, they do things so much differently now to the, the way that we learned. So I was also doing quite a lot of Googling um, as a as a parent as well to try and work out <laughs> what their what their kind of techniques for for learning really are now because they're just just so different and all the terminology as well. I mean, we were taught a lot of these things at school, but we weren't taught what the terminology behind them necessarily was. So it, it, it's been an education and um, trying to work from home while you know caring for the kids and uh, supporting their learning and doing everything else on top of that was. It was challenging. Yeah, yeah. Now, you, I said that at the beginning, you, you're an SNP activist. You've actually stood for deputy leader uh, and you've stood as a candidate. So, I mean, you've covered a lot of the waterfront here. But, but uh, And you're based in, uh, in Compass Line, but you, that's not where you're from. You're from the borders. Is that right? Yeah, so Cumbernauld, what's it called? Cumbernauld. Um, yeah, no, so I grew up in uh, Kelso in the, in the Scottish borders and only left when I went away to university. I went to study in Edinburgh and studied, unsurprisingly, politics. Um, but the first 18 years of my life were, were spent in the borders. Um, so it was quite nice. Recently, we managed to, to get back there for a few days because I hadn't been back for a whole year uh, to see my family. And that's, I think that's the longest I've ever been without actually being, you know, being, being in Kelso and uh, being around my family. So that was, that, that was lovely. Um, but also love living in Cumbernauld. It's such a brilliant quality of life. And what a lot of folk don't know about Cumbernauld is that more than half of the town is actually green space. So people have a certain vision and, and view of, of what Cumbernauld um, is like. And I don't think it is necessarily uh, reflective of what the town the town is actually like uh, these days. So it's a, it's a great place to live, great place to bring up a, a family as well. And you're so central, you know, you're right in the doorstep of Glasgow, you know, up into Perthshire, 
no bother at all. So it's a lovely place to live. I mean, that's the beauty of living in, in Scotland, is the fact that wherever you live, you know, the countryside is only, what, 15, 20 minutes away sometimes. And just getting on a bus will take you there very often. Uh, there are very few places in the world where that's the case, uh, where you don't have to share it with six, seven million other folks who've taken the same decision that day. To... <laughs> well, yeah, so we've, we've not done a great deal, um, even since the restrictions have been lifted, just because it was obviously still quite busy in a lot of the really great places that folk want to go. So we're taking it quite easy in terms of tentatively starting to um, do things and try and get kind of some normality back. But we're so lucky to have all this green space on our, our doorstep. We've got some amazing walks. We can just go out our front door and we've got so many kind of great uh, routes that we can take to explore. And you it's forget <laughs> in the middle of the town over 50,000 people. <laughs> it's extraordinary. The, uh, now you've, in addition to your work in politics and, and raising a family, as if that weren't enough, to keep everybody more than busy, uh, you've been uh, you've worked uh, for the Federation of Small Businesses uh, and Amnesty International. Uh, these two don't sound as if they're completely the same. Was there some overlap between the two, or no? No, they're just different, I suppose, aspects of, of policy. So the the job with the the Federation of Small Businesses was good. It was a, a policy job. Um, and I really enjoyed it because you're really supporting a lot of micro small businesses. So it's a lot of individual um, individuals running running a, a, a business. Um, and so it was quite good to be able to work on things like the, the small business bonus, which actually really makes that a massive difference um, to small businesses. Um, and it was while I was there, I saw the, the job going for Amnesty International. And to me, working for Amnesty was more than a job, it was one of those things I'd always said to myself, oh, I'd love to do something like work for Amnesty International. So the fact that they were actually paying me to do that work was just was just a bonus. And so I ended up staying there for eight years because it was such a brilliant, varied job. You were covering lots of different kind of issues around many different countries around the world. The only reason I really moved on from that was because it was just after about eight years it was hard going. Yeah. Because yeah. every day you were basically working on issues and reading the stories of the very worst of humanity. Yeah. And so yeah. the, the counter to that was always, you know, the stories of human rights defenders who are absolutely phenomenal people who really put themselves in harm's way to defend others and to stand up for, for what's right. But when you were starting, particularly once I had kids, to read stories of what was happening to, you know, two-year-olds and, um, and folk around the world, I'm like, I just... I was like, oh, I needed to take a, a step back from that because it's hard going and hats off to loads of the folk that work for Amnesty and other human rights organisations around the world on the front line because they, they are really putting themselves in, in danger quite a lot too. Yeah. Um, to stand up for, for folk and to stand up for what's right. But yeah, really, really interesting and, and varied kind of roles, which I've been lucky to do. We've had one or two questions. Um, okay. Well, Gordon McIntosh, I think perhaps feels that I was a bit unfair in criticising uh, Boris Johnson uh, because he said, didn't the SNP leave the invitation to the last minute uh, knowing that uh, that uh, Boris's schedule would be full? Well, I suppose the answer to that is if you're going to visit uh, the head of a major administration, uh, there's a protocol involved, i.e. there are people who are specially hired <laughs> to make sure that uh, any prospective invitation is anticipated. Uh, so we, we one wouldn't expect to uh, find out at the very last minute when that would have been trialled and tested beforehand. But maybe I'm giving too much credit to, uh, to number 10. That's what would happen in normal, civilised uh, political structures. Uh, but maybe that they don't quite qualify for that description. Um, tell us about your work because you, you're also involved in a charity. Tell us yeah, about yeah. the charity and why. Oh, well, well, actually, it's kind of ended up, it was kind of related to being involved in, in the SNP as well. So it was during the, the referendum, just after, I think so many of us had that that optimism. And I, and I genuinely thought um, in the final weeks of, of that campaign that we were going to do it. Um, and such levels of hope and optimism. And like a lot of people, it was, you know, it was a, a really devastating experience um, 
to lose because it just took away all of that hope. Um, certainly in the, the short term. So one of the things that I then looked to do um, was look at ways of helping now. You know, we were stuck mm-hmm. with the Tories, we were stuck with Westminster, what can I do now? Um, eradicating poverty, tackling poverty is something I've always felt very strongly about. It's a large reason why I got involved in politics and why I joined the SNP. And I knew of another SNP activist who'd set up a school uniform bank, so it was helping uh, kids with families who were struggling to basically buy those essentials um, and people could be referred to, to the uniform bank and basically be kitted out for going back to school. So that's uh, Sandra Douglas. So she's a, an SNP activist as well. So I messaged her and said, I really want to set this up for, for Cumberland and Concise, where, where I live. Um, and she said, oh, I've had another woman from Cumberland message me about that. So she put us in touch and we randomly met for a coffee, uh, decided we really liked each other. We both really agreed with what we were trying to do. Um, I'd read something about a baby bank being set up. So we decided to set up um, basically a, something to support families. So we do baby essentials, general clothing and, and school uniform. Uh, so that's what I've done with my spare time for the last five years. We've, we've built it up. We've helped thousands, uh, thousands of kids. Um, and to me, it's the other side of the coin of, of, I suppose, of your political activism. And what we are doing now with the charity is trying to help people in the here and now who don't have what they need. But it's a sticking plaster and we shouldn't have to exist. Yeah. So, And we're always going to have to until we can affect social change and independence is the way to do that. So I've had lots of, you know, conflicts and crises around how do you justify spending your time split between political activism and actual voluntary work on the ground that you can see is making a difference. I mean, the feedback that we get from uh, about families, from the social workers, family nurses, and the rest is, is phenomenal. It, it's just so lovely to know that you're making that difference That's to, to any kids. That's but good. we need to get the changes to stop poverty happening in the first place and independence is is, is how you do that because it will give us the weavers and the powers to do it. Is that why you were attracted to the Social Justice and Fairness Commission? Oh, I mean, absolutely. As, as soon as I was asked to, to get involved in that, I did not hesitate um, for a number of reasons because of the, the remit, um, the focus about it being about social justice um, and about tackling poverty. How, how do you do that? But the other reason was. It was the fact it was it was an overview, it was so comprehensive. So it wasn't like go and develop this area of policy in isolation where you know ordinarily you will you will look at the context, but your focus is on one thing. You're looking at the whole structure of what we do and how we do it to really affect transformational change. So the policy work within it um it's really important and to me they're really good examples of what we could do and arguably what we should do and um, rather than what we will do but that they are the four examples this is what we could do with independence and if we're able to change how we govern change how we make decisions that is going to be key and independence is is the foundation of that it's once we have those powers we can join the dots and really affect mm-hmm. the transformational change across all of the all of the challenges we face as a country, which it, you know most countries around the world face. So it's not unusual to face lots of challenges, and independence just allows us to to get to grips with those in a coherent, comprehensive way, um, rather than dealing with policy issues in isolation. So it was a you know it was a really great opportunity to try and, and shape that and support that work and to work alongside some really great uh, work as part of the process as well. well. Let's just talk a little bit about, it's called the Social Justice and Fairness Commission. Why do you need fairness? I mean, I would imagine anything that was socially just would be fair. I think it's more. I think it's just more to describe what social justice is. So I suppose it's social justice is fairness, but I think it's more to to demonstrate that that's essentially what social justice is is about. Um, I think most people understand and comprehend and will use fairness in their everyday lives in a way that they probably won't use social justice. It's probably more of a political or a, a policy term. 
So I think it's about reflecting, just reflecting the sort of different use of, of language um, and making sure it's as inclusive as possible. Yeah, the, st the strap line says um, uh, a route map to a fair, independent Scotland. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I mean, it's almost like motherhood and apple pie. Who's going to disagree with you on that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But that's, but that's it, you know, it's so easy to say it. It's so easy to say, well, I believe in social justice, I believe in fairness, and I believe in equality. But the, the really difficult thing is is looking at how, well, how do you deliver that and defining what fairness is. And, um, you know, it's a really interesting word and concept because when you ask people to define what is fair, you'll get lots of varying responses, but it's, it's actually easier to get a response as to what's unfair. We all instinctively know when we see something that is unfair. Um, so I think the report does a quite good job of setting out what we would consider to be that fair and socially just society, um, you know, predicated on a well-being economy and compassion of, of running the country for people and also with people, um, you know, about government not just being something up there that, that does things to people and that people, that's what people regard it as. So that's when you start to you know, generate apathy. So you can understand why people are apathetic and um, cynical uh, about politics, but the more that you can empower and involve people in the decision-making process, not only is that, you know, that healthy for your democracy, but you get better policy as a result. If you're making policy for people without involving the people it affects in the process, it's just not going to be as good. And by the time it's actually implemented at ground level, it's maybe not as effective as it could be. So that's why I think yeah. things like, you know, the way the Scottish government designed Social Security Scotland was actually a really brilliant step in, in the right direction because it involved people with lived experience of the system. And it was down to things like the colours of the envelopes that the decisions came in. So people were saying they were quite traumatised by getting these DWP envelopes and the brown envelopes and the kind of stress that created so you know they come in a different color envelope so it's, it's things like that you would never have known unless you actually spoke to people about it and about putting people at the center of it their their dignity and actually their right to a decent standard of, of living um, so, so it, it, human rights. That, that makes so much sense uh, and, and i've read the report uh, and the commission's report which i think was published in march this year if anybody watching tonight and listening tonight wants to get a copy of this, I take it they can just go to the, is it the SNP website? Will it be available there or will it, is it? It is, it is on the, the SNP website, but it's also on the Commission's website. So um, it's on the Social Justice and, and Fairness Commission. So folk could just put in a search for that. It will, it will come up and it's under the publications. And there's two documents. So there's the full report, which is over 130 pages. And then there's the executive summary, which is a good introduction to to what the report is is about, and for those that want more of the policy detail, they can read the the full report as well. But it's, it's you know it's written in a very accessible um, yes, way. It's designed to be a yes, document yes. that can inform debate that anyone can dip into and take out relevant information to help make the case for independence and yes. what kind of Scotland we that could be with independence. Yeah, I mean, it does. It does say on page three, social justice is not a luxury. Uh, we should aim for when times are good. Uh, when times are hard, it's even more important uh, than ever to ensure that society is fair and just for everyone who lives here. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a huge ask. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, for example, you know, if you look at how to pay for programs like this, I can imagine people on the right. Uh, maybe more than people on the right saying, "Well, uh, I mean, how how could you? How, every time you raise my taxes, I think that's unfair." <laughs> and so, therefore, they would say, "You haven't met your first criteria, which is to be fair and just for everyone." Because I don't want to pay tax, uh, if I, and you're asking me to, maybe to pay more tax. I think that's unfair and unjust. How would you respond to that? Well, it depends, I suppose, on your your viewpoint about both political and and moral and as a as a citizen it's like well do you believe in collectivism and do you believe in society or not um and it's the fact that it's a you know if you lift people out of poverty you lift your whole society so even if 
some people, you know, from their own personal point of view, don't don't want to pay more tax. Actually, you can by investing in dealing with some of these challenges and lifting people out of poverty, you actually are still investing in something that you get something back out of. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the you know the single biggest thing that you could do to improve quality of life and most of the challenges facing our country are to eradicate poverty. When you think of the cost to the NHS of poverty, of you know, we talk about health inequalities, we talk about period poverty, we talk about fuel poverty, and all these other kinds of poverty, and all these initiatives that we have to mitigate and tackle, they're all just poverty and the fact that people do not have enough to live on. But if you can eradicate poverty and actually er then reduce and start to eradicate a lot of health issues related to poverty, yeah. in terms of attainment. You know, the, the reason that there's such unequal attainment is largely due to, to poverty. Uh, and so if, if you can start to invest in the well-being yep. of us all, actually you start to reduce the challenges and you save money in, in other areas. So it's almost like a short-term investment to get a better society in the longer term. And some I things aren't that, always about spending more money. You do things differently. Yeah. I think that makes sense. And I, and I think a lot of people watching and listening tonight would applaud what you've just said. But I, I, there's one or two pieces in the commission report I find difficult to, to, to comprehend. I mean, for example, there's a sentence here that says, social justice and environmental justice go hand in hand. Well, I, I live quite close to a major petrochemical plant and they're constantly being accused of polluting the environment. And one of their answers is, look at the jobs we provide. Mm -hmm. That's true. They do provide jobs. There's no question about that. Uh, could these jobs be provided elsewhere? Almost certainly. But it wouldn't happen overnight. So there would be a case where social justice and environmental justice probably don't go hand in hand. Uh, th th there may be other examples as well where, you know, if you want to do, if you want to be green, uh, you could actually have a bigger challenge in bringing about some form of social justice than if you chose just to be, uh, you know, profligate, frankly. Uh, any comment? Yeah, I, this is obviously a personal view, but I think it's about how, it, it's, it's about it in the broader terms. So, you know, if you look at it from individual points of view or individual cases, it is a there is quite often a direct conflict. I mean, it's it's the same when you look at human rights, you know, and in protecting the rights of one group, actually are you compromising the rights of another in in it in exactly. inadvertently. So it's all, it's about a framework. But when we're looking at social justice, environmental justice going hand in hand, we know that actually the, the impact of of environmental policies quite often has the effect of hitting folks that can least afford it. So if you start taxing some things that everyone uses that's yeah. environmentally bad it's yeah. the people that are already struggling um that actually pay at a higher cost proportionally so it's about taking into account when we are i mean and we absolutely have to otherwise there's going to be no planet left if when we are taking forward policies to, to combat climate change that they do not disproportionately impact on those who can least yeah. afford it so there's there's that aspect to it as well but it is about supporting people to make those individual changes, those individual choices, because the reality is that most of the really good things that you can do cost a lot of money. And mm -hmm. the government does, you know, provide loans for things um, for certain things and does subsidise certain things that allow you to make those positive choices. But for most people, those positive choices are, are out with their, their financial um, uh, reach anyway. Um, so it's, it's about ensuring that in the round and some situations, you know, you will have things that are, are polluters or, you know, companies and jobs that are, are bad for the environment. And if you then take action against those, there has to be positive investment in another way, um, much in the same way, you know, if you're talking about closing Faz Lane sure. and you're saying, well, there's going to be jobs lost. Well, then you need to look at can, can well, we, how do we, we create we those a, jobs elsewhere? Can we take a look at that side of the equation just for a second? All of these programmes, and I think you're recommending another three commissions be established. Uh, that, that's a that's a big that's a whole chunk of extra spend just running the commissions alone. Assuming that that they were approved, uh, would, would require significant investment. One imagines. So, where's the money going to come from to pay for all of this? 
So a lot of it's about consolidating work that already happens. So the Living Income Commission would be doing the job of that different bodies do um, at the moment. Okay. Um, and I think to me that's that's one that really stands out because it brings things together in a more coherent way. Um, you know, when you're looking at tackling poverty, social security is only part of the the answer. That's about uh, providing the baseline that you know people do not fall below this certain line. But that's not, you know, we want to provide in people more than just the minimum. Um, and work is a key part of that, and can be a key part of that if you have fair work that actually allows people to to work in in a flexible way, gives them good pay and and conditions. So work is a key route out of poverty and it isn't always at the moment because wages aren't sufficient for people to live off so it is important that you bring together um under one um, kind of decision making body or advisory body the different elements of what is the minimum income standard that we think everyone in this country should be able to reach what are the levels of social security payments how does that relate then to the, the national I, I, living wage? With respect, Julie, that, that again is about spending money. That's about saying uh, we want to give people who are disadvantaged a, a leg up. We want to help them. We want to look after the most disadvantaged groups in society. Nobody's going, I suspect, unless there's some sort of horrible right winger is going to argue with any of that. I mean, frankly, I, I suspect there isn't a single sentence in the uh, commission report that many people would take umbrage that mm. absolutely not the question remains though um, where, where where does the resource where the resources come from in order to finance this because you're talking about i imagine significant expenditure so right now that money comes in the form of block grant uh, where would the money come from in a, in an independent scotland would the would it come out of the growth commission recommendations for example well, we, I mean, people say all the time, it's like, how are you going to pay for this? How are you going to pay for independence? And so, well, the same way that every other country in, in the world pays for things through combination of, you know, general taxation and various other uh, revenue raising uh, taxes uh, and the rest of it. So there's a big pot and it's all about how you divvy it up and you decide how you decide to spend it. So there'll be some things that I think are an absolute waste of money that I would hope that we wouldn't spend money on, like uh, nuclear weapons. Um, so it's all about choices, yeah. and and I think that's we've re- we've recognised that in the commission that we're not we're not costing it. We're saying this is a blueprint for where we want to get to, and that is then uh, that is a massive task, is a, a conversation a- around how to do it. And we think we've put some uh, principles and values there uh, to, to to guide that in terms of it being a, a well being economy and the importance of investing. In, in sectors that also create a social good, so it's virtual, uh, you know, virtual, mm-hmm. virtuous cycle, and almost uh, you know akin to the donut uh, economics right. uh, model. Mm-hmm. So it's, you're, you're, you're creating that, but that's it is a, it is it is a big spend and it is a big outlay, and that's why it's important that with independence we change how we are making decisions mm-hmm. and ensuring that all of these big decisions, because they're so fundamental, they're huge. You know, we're talking about creating a social security system akin to um, the NHS when it was created and, and creating that same that affection and that respect and understanding that it is an important institution that is there for us all in our times of need and it could and any one of us could need it at so any point. I, mean, the, 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 like, like I, said, I would commend the, the commission report, at least the executive summary, the 30 odd pages that I've read. The question I would ask is that this is a report that has, was done for the SNP. It, it wasn't necessarily done for the Scottish government. Uh, so what, let's let's imagine there's people in the audience tonight thinking, "I really like this. I, I I think it's outstanding, and I want to see it happen ASAP." What are the steps between the report being published in March this year and its implementation, if at all? Mm-hmm. Well, they're just our, our recommendations, so no one is no one is bound by them. And the commission, um, so it was established by um, the first minister, but in her capacity as, as party leader. So it was an SNP endeavour, but not everyone on the commission was a member, and, and still wasn't a member of the, of the SNP. So it was it was it was work that was done independently of the party. Although we did engage with with the SNP at various points, we took our. Uh, 
uh, our paper on a secure income, for example, to one of the national assemblies and did some robust consultation um, around that there. So the report was finished in March, but it was actually just published just after the election um, in, in May. Um, so the next steps, well, there's, there's different steps. So for, for the party, it is there and it is there to be put forward in terms of resolutions to our conference. So the party can adopt any of it. They can say, that we can say, that's great. We like everything in this report. We should uh, do it all. Or, or as I understand from conversations I've had with people trying to, to draft resolutions, they're taking out different aspects of it to focus on and actually develop. So these are recommendations and it's up, for the, it's up to the SNP. And when I say the SNP, I mean the wider membership of the SNP to use it how they will. They can use it as a tool um, to campaign for independence. To, they can use it to make the case. They can use it to start further policy development because a lot of the ideas in there as well are conversation starters. You know, we're, we've mentioned things like the 20-minute neighbourhood, things like intergenerational care, you know, providing care homes and um, nurseries within the same setting and having that intergenerational contact. There's loads and loads of ideas in there that we've given an option for people to develop. There masses, there's no question. Now, the First Minister commissioned this report. She appointed the commission, is that right? Yeah. What's her reaction been to its publication? I think it's generally the same as everyone that has read it that I'm, I'm aware of in, in the party that they they really welcome it it's I think even it was even welcomed by the Labour Party spokesperson in the Scottish Parliament who uh, took part Neil Gray had a, a members debate on it and I think he said something like um they couldn't disagree with a, a word in it um it was just about delivery so I mean it's it's a good it's a good, comprehensive, solid piece of work, but in of itself, it's not the final word. Word. It is a conversation started. It is something that we think is a good foundation to develop further policy and to to have a lot of debates around. Because you know, well, well, this, well, 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 thank you for. That. Let's take a few questions, if we if we may. Uh, Mike Fenwick is asking, and I think you may have alluded to this, if not completely answered it. But let me ask you the question anyway. How are the cha- how are changes to be delivered? through central government, local authorities, social enterprise, charities, top down or bottom up? What do you recommend? Well, I think, yeah, so yeah, so that one of the, the, the really important recommendations in, in the Commission's report is a, a, a reform of, of our local democracy and ensuring that when we have independence, powers are then devolved to the, to the most appropriate level and that power should be situated as close as possible to the communities and the, the people uh, that are affected by them. Um, so we really need a massive uh, shake-up in terms of how local government works and ensuring that communities actually have not just a, a say in terms of consultation, but actually more power over how resources are spent in their community. So, for example, where, where I live, if there was a choice about how much you spend on a skate park or a, you know, a, a wildlife garden, why on earth should that be decided when I live in Common Old in, in Motherwell? Why can our community here not decide how those resources are, are being spent? And about much more participation, we'd like to see much greater use of citizens' assemblies, collaborative um, decision making, co-production. It should all be about, and to you know, to me, independence isn't just about the transfer of powers from London to Edinburgh. It is about the transfer of powers from London to the people of Scotland. And that does mean much greater empowerment of each of us as citizens to have a say in how things are run. So central governments are going devolving power down and doing the strategic yeah. stuff. But you make a very good point, Julie. And again, I think Mike Fenwick and many of the other uh, questioners tonight would almost certainly agree with that. But the SNP has been in power for as a government for 12 years. How come? You're having to recommend this now, which seems to many people uh, in the audience tonight to be straightforward, <laughs> something that's desirable. Uh, how come it hasn't happened? Well, it, in, in some ways, it, it, it does seem straightforward, but it, it, it's actually not as, as straightforward as, as it might be. And I think when we've only got partial powers in the Scottish Parliament as well, you're then devolving down and actually you've not got enough powers in, in the Scottish Parliament to do a lot of the coherent policy making 
uh, kind of work that you need to do. So we have, you know, it's the, the old saying about having one hand tied behind your back. So yeah, there, has been, there has been change in local government. There's much more involvement, like participatory uh, and, uh, budgeting. And, uh, there is that sort of change in culture. Take the example you gave us, Julie, just so that I understand it better. What, what right now inhibits you from deciding about your local play area? And why does it, why right now does that have to be decided in Motherwell? Why couldn't that be dealt with right now? That's not anything that requires somebody in Westminster to transfer power from no. Motherwell to Compass. <laughs> yeah, no, and a lot of a lot of local authorities are 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 actually taking uh, you know that approach. So one of the members of the the commission is John um, Alexander, who is the leader of, of Dundee uh, City Council. So he was talking about um, a lot of this, you know, a lot of these changes, and he was saying it, it was something as straightforward as they were going out to a community and saying they wanted a pedestrian crossing so it was like right okay going for a pedestrian crossing and they're like no no we don't want it there but all the experts were like this is where you put it this is where one puts a pedestrian crossing but the community said but that's not where people cross the road so they put it where people said um, and in terms of what the, the budget and the consultation they didn't just go through the motions and go and speak to community councils people who are, are, are fabulous but it's a small number of, of people so they were sending people out to different locations like football matches, supermarkets with iPads and going out and, and speaking to people. So there is room to innovate at, at the moment. But I think we need, you know, I think the commission recommendations recommendations are clear that we need much more in that direction. And and we're quite clear in the in, in the commission's report as well that most of what we're looking at is long longer term uh, policy for independence. So it's not stuff that we could do overnight, but there are lots of recommendations in there as well that come out from our conversations and our work that we could do now. So yeah. we are yeah. recommending that the Scottish government do some things now, but it's not for us to to compel. It's really for the party to pick up and say, well, do we support this? Um, and you know, we, we're ending up. You could end up with quite different positions in terms of what the recommendations of the commission are. Ultimately, what the party adopts as policy. Um, and I think, you know, when you look at the kind of focus on UBI versus minimum income guarantee, I think the SNP government and the SNP um, are much, I, I think, much warmer to UBI uh, than the Commission report was. I think the Commission report is much more evenly balanced between UBI and minimum income guarantee, which reflects the views of the, the members of, of the Commission. So nothing that the Commission recommends um, binds the SNP in any way, shape or form. It's purely the recommendations of the people who were involved in, in the process. Um, and then with that, we've got our, our personal views. About yeah. the I think, I think some, some people, will, when they read the report, will find that um, difficult to understand because it makes such abundant good sense, <laughs> frankly. Sparing your blushes, it does. Uh, uh, and I mean, for example, Fiona Greer was saying uh, there's only been one citizens' assembly so far. Mm -hmm. This looks like I mean, poverty and these issues, social justice and fairness, looks like an ideal candidate for a citizens' assembly. Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. And to look at a lot of issues as well, I think we've recommended um, one on uh, drugs policy uh, and covering decriminalisation as, as well, because it goes back to everything that we were, we're talking about in, in the route map and, and the democratic renewal. It's about how we make decisions. And we have to make decisions that are grounded in the actual real life lived experience of, of people in, in Scotland and making sure that they're robustly tested because government isn't easy. Government is just a series of really difficult choices. You know, nothing is nothing is straightforward. If you do one thing, you're not doing something else. If you're emphasising something, then you're not doing other things. And even if you've got lots of people working across lots of different areas of government, it's still choices. If you're investing money, then you're not investing money in another area. So this has to be, when you're making these really important decisions about high level spending and what your strategy is and things like the eradication of poverty, these can't just be the policies of one political party having a conversation with itself. It has to be grounded in what people in Scotland think, the citizens, but also engaging with other political parties. I mean, this is 
part of the the issue that we have is about trying to create spaces where people can come in with different perspectives and debate things respectfully um, and robustly. And what, what I like about the commission report as well is that we actually haven't held back from advocating for change, advocating okay. changes that the Scottish government could enact in the short term um, at all. Um, we, we haven't <laughs> limited ourselves in that way. And it's within the spirit of how the SNP does debate yeah. policy develop policy it's through robust debate and the fact that people can just yeah. chuck in ideas and, and have yeah. them discussed. Oh it's very it's very healthy. I mean the whole idea of debate and discussion seems to lots of people to make lots of sense. But taking up and that's a question we've had from Lars he's saying mm. I now find that we don't have enough powers line very tiresome. Uh, what in reality could a Westminster government do if Scottish government just legislated and started to deliver on a policy deemed reserved it's a fair point because most recently, in fact, in the papers this morning, uh, a Scottish government minister is saying we're going to set up drug centres, mm -hmm. even though officially, formally, we ought not. And they've been told categorically, you ought not. Mm -hmm. And she's saying we're going to do it anyway. Uh, I, I, and I think in that regard, she's responding to the needs, yeah. the clear needs that has been demonstrated, coupled with the fact that there's pretty much a cross-party consensus. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so you could argue she's pushing against an open door, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. she's actually departed from the, the old established uh, situation, which is, if it's reserved, we can't do anything. So having broken that, that conformity, I imagine lots of people are going to say, hey, why don't you do it in other areas too? How would you yeah, feel about that? How would yeah, you feel well, about the Scottish government legislating in reserved areas? In principle, you know, and, and particularly in this area, there isn't really a, an issue. There is a, there is an imperative to do it. The, the, the challenge comes, you know, and when things need to be paid for. So, you know, we couldn't just legislate to put up pensions because then how do you physically go about um, actually delivering that? We do not have physical control over certain elements that would allow us to do it. But the idea that we don't we don't actually take any action when something is reserved, actually a huge chunk of what the Scottish government does is react to that and deal with mitigating the policies that are reserved. So and, and that's become a, an expectation now. So that you know we're closing the post offices, right? Scottish government, we need a fund to help the post offices. Oh, we're introducing the bedroom tax. Right, Scottish government, what are you going to do to that? So a huge amount of time and resource is actually spent within our devolved administration dealing with the rubbish that Westminster um, sends our way. So we are, in effect, dealing in, in, a, in a roundabout way with reserve policies because we are saying, well, we're not going to implement that. We're going to find a way to mitigate that. So they do quite often react in that way. They don't just say, oh, well, that's, that's come in. We're not going to act and we're not going to do anything about that. Um, and I'm, you know, personally delighted that uh, Angela Constance has, has taken this view, and it was something that we pushed for in the the commission report. Um, you know, asking the Scottish government to really push at the boundaries of what could be done um, within uh, devolution, um, and that of course means pushing at the boundaries of where that sort of jurisdiction for decision making lies. So that's a really positive development. It's one of the it's one of the key issues that we focused on in the in the commission report, just because it is such a, a horrendous uh, health issue. But again, that goes back to you know where people say, "Oh well, we're tired of people saying, well, we can't do this or we can't do that because we've we've not got independence." But to me, drug addiction is one of those key points. So we have lots of powers over certain aspects of dealing with addiction in terms of, of treatment, um, but the how do you start to stem the tide of people who fall victim to addiction when we actually know that poverty is a huge driver of that and we don't have all the powers to tackle poverty? So, you know, we've only we've been given really, really difficult challenges um, as a government in Scotland, but only half the tools, if even that, that we need to tackle a lot of these challenges. And when we're even all the work and all the investment that's gone into to dealing with child poverty, for example. 
So the Scottish child payment can just be wiped out by Westminster taking money away um, in terms of the universal credit cut. So all the work that we do to mitigate, mitigate against the horrendous uh, policy decisions of, of a Westminster government, that, that is all about challenging the, the reserved powers, in, in my view. We don't just say, oh, well, that's their responsibility and we're not going to do anything about mm -hmm. that. Where we have the powers and resources, we do try and mitigate against the impact. So we stop, we basically put up a dam um, to stop a lot of the worst of Westminster's uh, decision making ever reaching. But, you know, there's a lot of water coming over that dam because we don't have all the powers to, to stop it and complete that. Yeah. Um, that process. I think that's a fair point. Uh, and obviously the SNP is critical in this because the SNP is the major independence party. Uh, Sandy Carmichael is saying, hi, Julie, what do you think of the draft list of conference motions? Does any one stand out to you as something you desperately want to see debated? I'm afraid I can't say because it's not an internal forum. So the um, provisional agenda of the for, for the party is actually confidential to to party members. Um, and I think because I've been a member for so long, I have got that drummed into my head. But because the party is so large, a lot of it ends up not being confidential. But I still find myself bound by by the constitution. Well, we don't want to get you into so trouble. I'm not, I'm not actually allowed to, to comment. But I think there are a lot of great. Um, resolutions on there and one of the things that I will this, this might sound like a bit of a self -work, but one of the things I really really enjoy doing and I've, I've done in the party for a number of years I used to be the political education convener and an important part of that role was in supporting branches to draft resolutions yeah. because you mm -hmm. can have great ideas but sometimes the resolutions just weren't drafted in a way that the committee which was SOAC and is now conferences committee would accept so I've spent a, a huge amount of time, and particularly in the last uh, few weeks, um, over the last few months, getting back to people and helping them draft their the resolutions. So I'm actually really happy that a lot of those resolutions are, are on the agenda as well, because I know the hard work that people put into them and, you know, doing their research, getting advice uh, and just having those debated. So I'm, I'm delighted for everybody um, that I've been in contact with that their resolutions are on the agenda as well. Good. Well, we wouldn't want you to talk about anything that's uh, sub judice or confidential or any other matter. But a number of uh, questioners are asking tonight uh, about working class representation uh, at Holyrood and the commissions and citizens' assembly, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it does appear as if it, these, a lot of these bodies seem to contain lots of middle class folks. What, what would your response to that be? Well, without going into the, the personal circumstances or naming names of, of, of people in the Commission, there were people um, intentionally invited onto the Social Justice and Fairness Commission because of their lived experience. And that includes lived experience of poverty and in helping communities um, who are struggling with poverty as well. So we did have people on the, the Social Justice and, and Fairness Commission who came from that background and we made sure that there was a, a diversity within the commission as well, making sure that we had representation um, from disability activists and being activists, um, uh, you know, people who are experts in gender equality um, as well. So the commission was actually very cognizant of that and the importance of empowering people to participate because it's and this goes back again to the recommendations of the Commission. If you just give people avenues to contribute and have their say, certain people will take up that opportunity with relish, but other people you have to go out, reach out and grab them. And I know from, from my community work um, locally, I know amazing people. And, you know, about 90 odd percent of them are women and working class women in their own communities going out and, and just getting stuff done and, and looking out for folk and looking after them and helping them, empowering them as well. So a big part of what I did with the commission is I made sure that I spoke to all, all the people that I knew with lived, ex, lived experience and practical experience of these kind of issues as well. But it is a, it is a massive challenge because people are self-selecting and it's much like politics. Um, 
you know, it's a really important thing that we need to remember because I think we're getting much better. Uh, we're still nowhere near where we need to be uh, in, in terms of ensuring diversity of candidates and, and activists um, across all the, all the parties. But where we probably haven't paid enough attention, I think generally is in you know, politics in Scotland, is looking at class and income because it's also the thing that most people who are underrepresented have in common, whether it's you know, disability or their gender or their race, it is income and it, it, it is class. And it's how do you break into it? And I know that um, you know, when I first joined the SNP, I'm working class from, from the borders. I didn't know a single person <laughs> involved in politics. My, my dad was uh, an ambulance driver. He was in the ambulance service for, for 38 years. And so he ended up, you know, really supporting Labour because he was in a trade union. Um, and my mum had voted Lib Dem uh, because that's what happened to the borders and it had I been. Um, and there's a sort of political consciousness um, really sort of came out because the, the strange daughter that they had that would come home from school and talk to them about sovereignty and independence and the SNP. Um, and they're, you know, SNP supporters. But it was, it was a big deal for me to join. So I, I started supporting independence in 1994 and I'd written, a, I'd written a letter away to all the political parties for my standard grade history project. But it took me from that kind of light bulb moment in 1994 that independence was what we needed. It was just so obvious to me. It was about democracy, it was about sovereignty. It took me till the year 2000, January 2000, it was a New Year's resolution, to have the confidence to join a political party because I didn't really think it was for folk like me. Um, and it was just an amazing experience when I joined because it was so welcoming, it was so inclusive, and those identities didn't really matter because it was like, well, you're, you're one of us because you're a nationalist. Exactly. You know? um, it was but really welcoming and inclusive. Doesn't that tell you a little bit about the educational culture that you didn't think that you were qualified? Because anyone watching this tonight is going to reach the conclusion, I can guarantee you, that they'll be saying, there's a smart, articulate person who clearly understands the subject. So since you were always clever and smart and understood things, what was it about your education, do you think, that made you think otherwise? I don't think it was about my education. I had repeatedly had my teachers who, who were brilliant at school tell me before I went to university, just to, you remember, you're good enough. You're particularly going to Edinburgh, they're like, you're going to meet people that, and you're going to think you're not good enough. And I remember, and believe it or not, for my first, for about my first year at university, because I was predominantly surrounded by people who were privately educated, a year older, and there were people in my, some of my classes driving around in cars that would have put me through university twice, I barely opened my mouth because I felt um, quite intimidated because they sounded so clever and they were so confident in how they presented their opinions. But isn't, isn't that, isn't that, doesn't that bear out my point, though, yes. is that individual yes. students were encouraged. But despite that, you were given the impression that because of your accent, the way you spoke, uh, whether or not you were uh, wealthy or not, that that in some way disqualified you. I mean, the reality is that a lot of the kids who went to the, the about different education system were probably told that uh, they were as good as anyone and they should speak up at every available opportunity, hang the consequences, because the likelihood is that whatever they said would strike a chord with those listening. Mm -hmm. well, that's that, why I, I spend all my time now I'm saying to people, if you've got something to say, say it. Because there's nobody, and, and I suppose, although that first year was tough, it taught me a really valuable lesson. So if I didn't think I was any better than anyone else, because I'm, I'm not, why do I think anyone else is any better than me? Exactly. Well, they're not. We're all the same. So actually, although it was quite a challenging thing, it was actually really useful in life. And particularly when you find yourself in meetings with, you know, the First Minister, and you're like, no, nah, I'm at Denver University. <laughs> There's no bother at all. But it does instill in you, not an arrogance, not, you know, not something, well, I'm, I'm it instills in you a really strong sense that we're all just the same. 
Um, and, you know, everybody is pretty much winging it through life. And that's not to say loads of people aren't experts, and I'm absolutely in all of them. But we're all just people born into different circumstances, doing our very best in life to try and be good people and get on with folk and, and have a nice nice life. But that, that was important. I actually found, although the first year it was the ability thing, after that, I, I found it really liberating and yeah. empowering to know that actually and it was quite good for then dealing subsequently with any Tories because I went to university with a lot of them and realised a lot of them have not done uh, the work they, they coasted through on the privilege um, that had been granted to them in the early years of, of their life so it, it was really really it was a good lesson in, in the end and I haven't shut up since as good, you might have good for you and I, hope, and, I, and I would trust and hope you will never shut up uh, we've only got three or four minutes to go, Julie. Are there any messages you would like to give the folks watching and listening tonight? Any any area that you feel we it would have been helpful to have covered that we haven't touched upon? Anything that's personal to you, anything that you feel is crucially important? Uh, for me, I think it's how, how do we use this report and not just this report, but the work that is going on across the movement. So, for example, the, the Believe in Scotland work that Business for Scotland are doing, there's a huge amount of actually material um, that's been produced and a lot of work that's been done across the movement within the SNP and beyond to make the case for independence. But for me, what is really important, and it's something that we have to overcome, is when I first found out about Scotland's constitutional situation, I, it, was a, it was literally a switch. You could almost see the light bulb in, going on over my head. Now, it's so frustrating when you are an activist going out and trying to persuade people of the need for independence and they just don't have that same reaction in that moment. What we really, really need to focus on over the next few while as we build towards the next referendum is putting ourselves in the shoes of people who are reluctant and who are sceptical and who do need that bit of reassurance and the bit of the case being made to them because they, those are the people that we need to reach. To, to make that decision and, and make that switch towards supporting yes. And I know through you know, my, my own networks of people that have switched from no to yes over the years, but they're not that easy to hang on to. We have, we've got to keep earning that trust and, and respect um, moving forward. But I am I'm optimistic that we are nearly there. Um, we, you know, if you support independence, we are the base. We're not going to go backwards. We just need to convince a few more people that it will, that it's doable um, and that it's desirable and that the change and the potential to build something so much better than we have at the moment, it, it is worth it. It is worth it. And not to sugarcoat that any of the challenges that are coming our way because people just won't believe you. We have to be really honest and open and upfront about the challenges that we will face because we will face lots of challenges, just like any other country in the world. Um, it's, everything isn't just fixed with independence. Independence is just the starting point. It's not the, de it's not the destination, that's the starting point, which we then use to build the kind of society that we want to, to live in. I think that, that makes so much sense. If I was, I'm not in the SNP, but if I were to be speaking to the First Minister tonight, I would say two things. One is I would act upon this report, uh, I would endorse it, welcome it, and give it my backing at any conference um, uh, uh, and, and see it enacted. Uh, I would also uh, espouse your recommendation that uh, it should be uh, enshrined in a written constitution so that any future government, which may be of a very different character, mm -hmm. did not chuck it out uh, and abandon it, having helped, I suspect, lots of people because they had some doctrinaire ideological uh, problem with it. Uh, so I would certainly endorse that. Uh, and I would say uh, that, that it's absolutely crucial to talk about how other co countries have achieved independence, because I'm not sure people do fully understand that. And they don't therefore understand that some of the obstacles that have been, dis have been suggested or proposed or threatened, uh, in fact, are commonplace. Other countries have dealt with them. It's not a big deal, uh, but unless you know that, unless you have that body of knowledge, then it sounds like you alone are confronting these 
for yeah. the first time in human history, and it just ain't so. So my recommendation would be to talk about that much more than is being done at present, because that reassures people uh, that, that, that the state will be a successful and effective state, as well as looking after its weakest uh, in that regard. Okay. Uh, someone has suggested you missed the point about the working class, but I'm not sure you did. I think you you dealt with it uh, uh, adequately, I would say. Anyway, we're, we're just about out of time. Uh, sorry, Kez, if, if I misrepresented your view. It, I wouldn't uh, task uh, Julie with that. It's my job to make sure that the, the question is, is put properly. So that's my responsibility. Look, we, we have literally run out of time. <laughs> And uh, as we always do when the, when the show is really good, thank you very much indeed, uh, Julia. I mean, it's Julia, it's been really great. Thank you. Appreciate it a lot. And a big thank you to all of you watching tonight and joining us tonight, uh, listening to us. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Uh, as always, we have a formidable list of guests lined up for future shows, and you'll be able to uh, follow all of those uh, sub, uh, future interviews on the What's On Guide. I would strongly recommend it. We're back next week at the same time uh, with Professor Paul Middleton. He'll be joining us next Wednesday at 7 p.m. And always, I always give a plug to either Elliot Bulmer or myself on the Constitution column in the Sunday National. I would strongly recommend you grab a hold of it this week. You'll find it in the seven-day supplement near the back. Uh, and I'll be dealing with a uh, crookery and corruption um, uh, and the fact that uh, uh, the uh, uh, Westminster government is, seems to be totally unaware of uh, the messages it's giving to the rest of the world uh, uh, because they seem to believe that nobody outside the UK reads the UK press. Uh, I, I can tell you they do, and they're not hugely impressed. As always, please support Indie Live and Indie Live Radio, new voices for a new Scotland, and for all the news that you're not getting. And if you like the TNT show, support Indie Live. Thanks again. And a good night. And join us next Wednesday. And remember, it's been a great day for British democracy. Oh, before I go, I really would like you all to join me in wishing our producer a very well-earned break with his family starting Friday. And, and here's an extra bonus, Scottonomics is on now at 8pm. So, to all of you, stay safe, take care, and a big thank you to Julie. Good night, everyone.